that's I think my biggest worry for her is her future and 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 how hard and challenging it might be but she shows us every day that she can do it she's strong hey you're listening to the rare life i'm your host madeline cheney and today we have episode six the story of nora nora is a two-year-old who has another form of dwarfism than kimball's it is called achondroplasia so I thought this conversation was super interesting in contrast with our last parent episodes with Alyssa about her son William, because um, the concerns um, in general are the same. Um, it is how we can help our children um, feel happiness and thrive, and how we can also have happiness and thrive um, with our children's different difficulties. The way that this conversation really was different than Williams, Nora has some pretty pretty minor medical concerns. And really our main focus in this conversation and Emily's concerns for her daughter is how to help Nora adapt to being much smaller than average height people. The way that Emily instills this confidence in Nora that she can do anything she wants to and that her diagnosis doesn't hold her back and doesn't define her uh, was really inspiring. Um, she, I think Emily is just doing a great job at believing in Nora and I have no doubt that Nora will continue to just really excel. Nora is just this cute little determined thing and I think she, she's awesome. I think she's going to go some great places in her life. And I just love the way that her whole family is just so supportive of Nora. And we also talk about some medical concerns because there are some with achondroplasia, both now and for her future. Emily also talks about the weight of being the expert of her child's medical team um, because of the rareness of her diagnosis and um, the power of social media and knowing where to kind of lead that medical team and what questions to ask and bring up, which is uh, also how Emily and I met. We met through social media um, because both of our children do have dwarfism. And um, a little disclaimer, this was recorded in the spring. So if you're confused about a few references to COVID-19, that is why. Emily is a special education teacher in central Massachusetts. Um, and she has an older son, Nate, who is nine years old. Emily is a lover of coffee and crafting. Let's get into our conversation. Emily, thank you so much for sharing your heart today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. So if you could start out by just telling us about your daughter, Nora, what is she like? Um, Nora's amazing. So she's two years old. Um, we found out at about 26 weeks that she was going to possibly have a form of dwarfism called achondroplasia. Um, her her ultrasounds were measuring, her long bones were measuring far behind um, average height babies. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was kind of a shock to us in the beginning. Um, She was very healthy in all the tests that she had. Um, Mm -hmm. Everything else was going well. Um, They just kept an eye on her growth. So that's kind of what led us down that path to start. Yeah. And that was all before she was born, right? While you were pregnant with her? Yes. So 26 weeks pregnant is when we found out that we may start this journey with her when she was born. What were your first, uh, your initial feelings? What was that like to be told that things weren't typical with your baby? Yeah, uh, we were completely shocked. Um, I was actually by myself at that appointment when we found out. So I was really taken aback um, and wasn't quite sure what to make of it. Um, I'm pretty sure I just kind of ignored it at first (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, and then ended up doing a lot of research on my own, which was scary um, and didn't turn up very many positive stories um, and kind Mm -hmm. of led me and my husband to do a lot more research and we probably should have stayed off the internet for a while. Um, (laughs) But in the end, it turned out wonderful. Um, yeah. We were scared for no real reason. I mean, she came out healthy and happy, and mm. um, she's just like a typical two-year-old right now, just small. 
Yeah. So tell me about Nora's whole personality. I know she has a lot of it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, She is very sassy, a little bit bossy, (laughs) um, super strong. She does things that we never Mm -hmm. imagined that she would do, um, both personality wise and just physically. Um, Mm -hmm. Things that we didn't expect her to do far beyond the time that she met those milestones. We were told that we should Mm -hmm. expect a lot of delays physically and things like that but she she did everything way before we thought she would um she's really smart she's social she loves her big brother she loves kids um she's very happy Mm. Um, she's pretty awesome that's amazing (laughs) and you mentioned too that uh she's really talkative right like she understands things really well (laughs) yes she understands everything we say to her (laughs) we have to be very careful what we say (laughs) that's really cute yeah so you mentioned that you were told to expect delays physically so what does that look like typically for achondroplasia um so most babies and toddlers like Nora don't um meet the physical milestones like sitting up um, walking mm. until a little bit later usually about six months past or more what oh, the okay. typical average height um, toddler would do so she started walking at 18 months but okay. we were told to expect over two years um, oh, before she would probably walk independently um, mm. most kids like her start sitting up on their own at about a year old um, okay. so it's a little bit delayed mm. from the typical um, developing infant or toddler yeah. we also aren't you're not supposed to sit her up in any sort of equipment or anything like that. So she had to lay flat for most of her oh. infant life um, until she could get to be sitting up on her own. We weren't supposed to put her in that position just because of her head proportion and her tendency to have spinal issues. Right. Um, so we had to wait for her to be strong enough to just pull herself up into sitting position. So that was kind of hard. She spent a lot of time laying down for yeah. the first year of her life so when you say spinal issues what do you mean by that like what kind of spinal issues um so kind of like kids can get scoliosis um kids like Nora with achondroplasia can get something called kyphosis which is a different kind of curve in the spine um and it can lead to problems down the road if it gets severe enough some some kids have to have surgeries or braces and Nora Mm -hmm. wore a back brace for um about 10 months um, until she was strong enough to hold herself straight. Does the brace kind of keep it, keep her spine from curving? Is that what it does? Yeah. It keeps her nice and straight so that she, uh, it kind of pushes the spine into the right position for her so that it wouldn't continue to curve and cause any damage Mm. to her back. Yeah. That's really interesting. So Kimball has another form of dwarfism, another you know, diagnosis under the umbrella of skeletal dysplasia. But I almost wonder if we should have, like, if he should have had something like that, because it's so rare that, like, we don't have a lot of research. We yeah. haven't even seen an orthopedic. Yeah. yeah. Orthopedic <laughs> specialist. Yeah. yeah that's which... one of Nora's team members. Okay. Right yeah. from the start. Yeah. Um, but it is hard when you have a rare diagnosis. Even our orthopedic specialist wasn't quite sure if she should have the brace or not. And we oh. ended up trying it because it wasn't going to harm her to have it but if we didn't do it we may be harming her spine so we ended up using it for a while until she was strong enough and she kind of fixed it herself her body kind of fixed it herself after a while but some kids don't get strong enough quickly the curve can end up getting pretty severe but once they start walking um, and they're more mobile and straight Sometimes it will just straighten on its own with some core mm-hmm. strength and mobility. Um, so that's kind of what where it went with Nora. Okay. What was yeah. that like for the first 10 months? It was hard because we started wearing it right after she started sitting up independently and started being more mobile. So it kind of set her back because her flexibility and her mobility was impacted by the brace. Yeah. Um, so it kind of slowed her down. She regressed a little bit until she could kind of overcome the stiffness of the brace and be able to to move herself better what was she doing at that point when she first got the brace like gross motor wise 
Yeah, she the, so she had just started sitting up and she was okay. doing she's doing an army crawl. Um, mm -hmm. Kids with achondroplasia don't usually crawl the typical way. So they do more of an army crawl. So kind of like on their elbows and drag their feet kind of behind them. <sighs> okay. um, because of their shorter limbs, they can't really get on their hands and knees the same way. Interesting. Um, okay. So sometimes they adapt. So there's the army yeah. crawl or the snow plow where they kind of use their head to get around a little bit. Okay, um, yeah. there's, a, there's a few different um, methods that they they kind of figure out the oh. best way for them to get around. So she was super fast on that oh. army crawl. She didn't need to walk because <laughs> she could get around really fast yeah. doing that. But the brace did slow her down a little bit because it was okay. just, it was really awkward and just yeah. hard to figure How out for her. What was that like? Like, what did it? Was it her whole torso, or? Yeah, so it's hips to armpits. Oh wow. Yeah, so that's where she needed that flexibility to kind of wiggle around when she was army crawling. So yeah. the crawling kind of came to a halt for a little bit. Okay. Until she could figure it out, better ways to do it, and then she started standing up because I think it became easier to just stand up and cruise than oh. crawl with the brace on. So she kind of yeah. figured out. She was standing up before she was actually sitting. I went, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, she would That's pull herself up and then plop back. That's how she taught herself how to sit. Oh. It's kind of cool to watch. Yeah. yeah. She's an overcomer. She's figuring it out, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Adapting. Yep. That's amazing. Yep. So what was that like to get to have, I don't know, be cleared of the brace or when they told you that she didn't have to wear it anymore? What was that like? It was such a relief. <laughs> it was such <laughs> yeah. a relief for all of us because it was hard to watch her struggle with it, even though we knew that it could help her down the road. And yeah. if we didn't use it, things could get worse. But when she had that x-ray and they just said that she didn't need any more, she's strong enough, she's fixing it herself. It was a huge relief. And then yeah. after that, she just took off. She started standing more and walking with mm -hmm. holding her hands. And then by... 18 months she was walking independently so mm. which was way before we thought we would see that happen so it's amazing yeah it was wow. great so does she is she pretty much cleared for her spine like will she have follow-ups for her spine still yeah we have to see them every six months unless something more urgent comes up we would see them more often but she'll have x-rays and consults with them every six months, probably for most of her childhood. Um, and then it's something that a lot of people with achondroplasia see an orthopedic specialist regularly okay. because of all the kind of the structural differences mm -hmm. in their bones. And so the way their bones grow can cause other things like the her legs, leg bowing can be another thing, her oh, okay. curves in her legs. They have hip problems sometimes, back problems, pain management kind of issues. Okay. So she'll probably see an orthopedic for her life. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What else do you have any kind of idea of what her life might look like in comparison to, you know, I don't know, a typical mm -hmm. child? Yeah. Um, from what I've learned from other adults that we've met through um, Little People of America and some friends of ours, they are just like every other person. They might have, like I talked about, some of the pain or the, the bone issues down the road, but they can live a very happy, healthy life just like any one of us. Um, mm -hmm. They can have some complications, sleep apnea, is one thing that's really common, um, sinus issues, ear infections, um, things like that, that can affect some people, not all, mm -hmm. but it's pretty common. Nora has some of that now, so we'll have to wait and see if she grows out of any of it mm -hmm. um, as she gets older, but um, she can do anything anyone else can do. Yeah. She just needs to figure it out in her way, mm -hmm. um, given her size, because she'll always be much much smaller than the average person so yeah it sounds like she's already learning how to do that right like with the different oh, yeah. forms of crawling and learning how to sit up like she's figuring yeah. it out yeah despite... she carries a stool she carries stools around all over the house <laughs> puts them where she wants to get something yeah she's she's pretty good she figures really it out resourceful that's amazing yeah. um so tell me about Nate her older brother and their relationship because I just love hearing about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, they 
are each other's favorite person. Like when they're in the room together with all of us, it's like me and my husband kind of disappear. Um, <laughs> they love each other from the start. Um, even when mm-hmm. she was brand new, newborn, she would just look at him like no one else. Um, mm. She follows him around all the time. She wants to do everything he does. Mm. Um, and he's really good about um, not babying her, given her mm-hmm. size. I mean, he's she's only two, so he babies her to a point, but not mm. related to her size, really. He 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 feels she can do anything and and she's strong and she's smart and she doesn't need a lot of help and mm-hmm. that kind of stuff so that's awesome yeah they're pretty close especially being um stuck at home for a month yeah. it could it could go many ways <laughs> but they honestly aren't sick of each other at all oh yeah they're loving it do you think that they'll miss it in a way like when it, when they go back to normal life I do. I definitely think um, they'll both miss it, but I think Nora will definitely miss having Nate around. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, they have a lot of fun together, even with the giant age gap, too. And yeah, yeah. And he can understand a lot about about her. So that's helpful Mm -hmm. because he's older. Wow, that's amazing. Um, So I guess we'll talk more about Nate too in our second episode in our special topic episode too yes. we're gonna to talk a lot more about him too um so I'm gonna back up a little bit when Nora was first born um what was life like did she go to the NICU how was that uh, she did not go to the NICU um she was mm-hmm. kind of in like the baby wellness um center with some close eyes on her, but nothing that she needed super monitoring, monitoring for. Um, Mm -hmm. The first couple days were really overwhelming. Um, There was doctors in and out constantly, Mm x-rays, testing, um, blood tests, all kinds of people just poking and measuring and because they still, it hadn't been confirmed, but it was, you know, we were pretty sure that she had achondroplasia. Um, There was Mm -hmm. a possibility that she might have had um, hypochondroplasia, which is very similar to achondroplasia. Um, So they were doing a lot of measuring and and just kind of poking at her. And so it was really hard for me because I just wanted to be with my daughter. But at the same time, I knew that they were just taking care of her. So it was a little bit crazy the first few days in the hospital. Um, But at the same time, I was really thankful that they were, you know, keeping a close eye on her and trying to help us figure everything out. Yeah. How long did it take you to get genetic testing back to know for sure? I confirmed that she had achondroplasia. Forever. (laughs) forever and ever it felt like forever um I believe it was about five months from the time Ah. she was born so we kind of we kind of always knew but we got the the real confirmation about five Mm. months later yeah okay how has Nora's diagnosis affected your family as a whole and the dynamics um it's at first it was pretty stressful. There was a lot of appointments, um, like weekly, it was crazy. Mm. Um, so that was hard, um, especially having my son too, who sometimes would have to come with us, um, depending on the timing of it. And, um, it was, it was pretty tricky at, at first, um, we didn't know a lot. So Mm -hmm. every appointment we would start learning more and more information. So it became more and more overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Um, and it felt like every time we left an appointment, we left with three new appointments or, (laughs) um, we didn't often leave with great news except for that she was healthy, which was of Mm -hmm. course all we really wanted Mm -hmm. but you know we'd go from the geneticist to the ENT to the orthopedic surgeon and then early intervention started and it was just it was a lot at first Mm -hmm. um it's starting to slow down a bit now that she's a little bit bigger Mm -hmm. um and even just 
holding her the right way, using the right equipment with her. It was all so unknown to us that we were just learning as we were going. So we were, you know, for a while I was afraid to hold her the wrong way. Like I didn't want to hurt her back or her spine or her neck. Um, So it was a little bit nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. And I kind of feel like sometimes we were robbed a little bit of the newborn stage just yeah. because we were worried so much. Um, yeah. We're definitely more relaxed now about it, even mm-hmm. with appointments and specialists and things like that. It's a little bit easier to process it now that we've been doing it for two years. Yeah. Compared to the first few months or so. Yeah. How does that, um, how do appointments work? So I know you're, you're a teacher. So how does that how do you guys work that out of having appointments? I mean, I can't even imagine. I'm home with Kimball all day and I, that keeps me busy all yeah. day. So how do you, how do you do I'm that? I'm extremely <laughs> lucky to work at the most supportive school ever. Okay. Um, I think being a special education teacher, working at a special education school is, is helpful because mm. they can understand that, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. Um, they've been super flexible and really understanding. Um, my husband and I sometimes will both have to take a day to drive into Boston to go to Boston Children's and it's mm-hmm. an all day affair. Um, I also mm-hmm. only work three days a week so I can be home two days with her. Okay. Um, and we try and schedule most of our appointments on those days that oh, okay. I'm home with her. Okay. So my sense. work has been very flexible around that. That's good. Yeah. Uh, how have you, so with your therapists, I, I mean, I'm assuming those are people you see more often than medical professionals. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So we used, um, she started early intervention at about two and a half months, actually, okay. um, which seems really early yeah. um, because they're not doing much, no matter if they have achondroplasia or <laughs> just a typical sleeping newborn. And eating and yeah. Sleeping and eating. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it was recommended to just get into the system so that when we did need okay. them, she would already be there and she automatically qualified because of yeah. her diagnosis. Okay. Um, so we would see them, it started off with once a week and then at some points it was twice a week and then we went to once a month. So we've kind of bounced back and forth. Um, right now, actually, she's only on a check-in basis. Oh, nice. So we're not receiving any specific um OT speech physical therapy mm-hmm. right now because okay. she's met all of the milestones, but she yeah. still qualifies. So we didn't want to lose our spot in case yeah. something came up down the road. Okay. Um, so we've kind of had a break for the past few months mm-hmm. as far as therapies go. Okay. Yeah. What has your relationship with your ther- with her therapist been like? And her doctors too, like just with her medical team, how has that, has that evolved at all since the beginning? Like how do you feel confident with them? Yeah, it's, so we've switched a couple doctors okay. from the beginning. Um, like because of, because like intentionally switched them or? Intentionally switched okay, them, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I wasn't happy with a couple. Um, most of her team I absolutely love and they take great care of her. And because they're all at Boston Children's except for one, the communication between all of them is easy because mm. they're all in the same system. Yeah. Um, so everyone knows her and knows awesome. her story and knows mm. her case. Um, what's hard about having a child with a rare diagnosis is that even the specialists of the specialists don't always know um, what to do in certain situations. Um, So we actually switched our orthopedic specialist from someone that specialized in skeletal dysplasias to someone that didn't um, because although she was a specialist, she didn't really individualize Nora's care. So she kind of had Nora under this umbrella and I had concerns that were not being addressed because it wasn't really related to what she thought specifically for her diagnosis so we ended up seeing someone else um outside of that team but everyone else okay. has been pretty pretty great um sometimes I'm still the expert walking into an a- appointment though um yeah. and sometimes I have to get a second or a third opinion within her team of about certain treatments or things that yeah. we're looking into because 
they're not sure really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which can sometimes be scary yeah. and a daunting <laughs> task to be the one that has to know all of it. Yeah. Um, and make those totally. decisions because I'm yeah. not a doctor, but <laughs> sometimes I have more information than they do based on kind of our outside network of friends that we've made and, and social media and groups and things that other parents are learning as they go Yeah. with kids that might be a little bit older than Nora, their experiences of things that they've gone through mm -hmm. have kind of helped me with questions to ask doctors and things like that as yeah. they come up. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like social media is like heaven sent for rare kiddos because mm -hmm. I've had that experience too, where I can get on, you know, the Facebook page and be like, guys, do they have vision issues? And like, they totally do. And I'm like, that's not in the literature, but I'm glad you right. told me that so I can bring it up, you know? Yeah. We're like conducting our own little so, research. <laughs> yeah. It's happened so many times, so many yeah. times. And then I'll bring it to the doctor and, you know, they'll be like, oh, well, let's look into this. Something they hadn't thought of before. Yeah. Yeah, that is so awesome. And I do I agree with you. I totally I haven't thought of it that way. But it's like you are the um, you are the head of the medical team, which is true for I think I don't know, I think the parent is always kind of the head of the medical team with any diagnosis, but especially with rare things. Because a lot of doctors have never heard of it, or they weren't right. trained specifically on that. And they're they're looking at the same research you have access to, you know, right. So and yeah, and also as a side note, um, Skeletal dysplasias. I was told that there are seven, over seven thousand different kinds of skeletal dysplasias. Right? There's, there's that? a lot. There's yeah. definitely a so lot. There's a yeah. Huge variants. So yep. a special, or I don't know, a doctor who specializes in skeletal dysplasias. I mean, that means she knows about the umbrella of seven thousand different right. kinds. Right. So, so it's not going to be very individualized. Right. And some are so much more rare than others. So like NORS mm -hmm. is the most common type of skeletal dysplasia, but it's still rare. So not right. every doctor has come across a lot of cases similar yeah. to, to Nora. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That's so interesting. Um, what about her? Like, what about therapists or early intervention therapists that have come to your home, especially yep. when they were coming more frequently? What is your relationship with them or what has it been? I love them. They, <laughs> um, so for the first, when Nora when she was a baby, it was easy because she just kind of laid there and they would give me some suggestions since there were certain things we weren't supposed to do with her. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of doctors will not recommend having any OT or PT um, mm -hmm. for kids with achondroplasia because they feel like the therapist may force the child to do things their, their skeletal system is not ready for okay. or their skeletal system can't... Um, can't do just physic mm -hmm. the way they're physically made um so that was another opportunity for me to be the teacher so I had to let them know what her specialists said as far as how far we can push Nora and what we should do with her mm -hmm. that's not going to harm her in any way and um the the two special the two therapists that came to my home did have a little bit of experience with people with achondroplasia oh, okay. um, so they weren't completely it wasn't completely out of their uh expertise, expertise I, I guess, guess. <laughs> yeah um so we kind of work together um, and just kind of let Nora do her thing. And the OT would give suggestions of how we could help her progress without pushing her. So kind of working mm. where she was at, okay. um, but maybe using tools that we had around the house to kind of help her. So if she wasn't, she was rolling over, but we couldn't help her sit up, what could we do to help her build core strength so that she could sit up on her own Okay. sooner um so maybe exercises or um using a folded up towel under her during tummy time just to yeah. lift her a little bit more things like that just small things that we could do to help her that weren't mm -hmm. going to push her in any harmful way um, okay yeah interesting okay yeah well emily i would love to end with just your last thoughts of of Nora, like how you, as her mother, what you think of her and, and your belief in her. Um, she 
I use the word amazing all the time, but she just, mm -hmm. she really is. Um, I feel like every day she's doing something to amaze me. Um, she's from the start has shown me that her diagnosis and her achondroplasia is not gonna, not gonna stop her. Mm -hmm. She's gonna figure it out. She's gonna be fine. Mm -hmm. um, Cause that's, I think my biggest worry for her is her future and, and, and how hard and challenging it might be. But she mm -hmm. shows us every day that she can do it. She's strong. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing about your experience with Nora as being her mother. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You can find adorable photos of her and her family at therarelifepodcast.com. She can be found on Instagram at emilyyoung3 and her blog is mylittlelove.net. Please share this podcast with anyone you know that could benefit from it. Let's spread the love. Join us next time for Emily's special topic episode full of tips about educating others about your children's differences. See you then.